from the world's greatest race course, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Coverage of the 76th running of the Indianapolis 500 is brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. With that clean, crisp, cold taste, nothing beats a Bud. By Goodyear, number one in tires. By Pennzoil, the motor oil that outperforms any leading motor oil against viscosity breakdown. Performance, protection, and quality ever since America learned to drive. And by Cadillac and your Cadillac dealer, who could change the way you think about American automobiles. Now, here's the radio voice of the Indianapolis 500, Bob Jenkins. 23 days ago, the gates to 559 acres of real estate on the west side of Indianapolis, Indiana, swung open for the 76th time, inviting spectators to witness a month-long celebration that climaxes with the world's largest single-day sporting event and inviting race drivers to participate in it. 47 answered the call to do so. As they searched for the speed that would make them among the fastest 33, there were highs and lows along the way. A former three-time world driving champion, Nelson Piquet, stole the hearts of many race fans and many drivers, but then was severely injured in a crash and today listens to this broadcast from a hospital bed. The defending champion, Rick Mears, survived a terrifying accident and three days later qualified for his 15th 500. A young Filipino driver, Jovi Marcello, was fatally injured during the month, ending his dream of making the 500, a dream he wanted for his country as much as for himself. We saw Roberto Guerrero continue to re-emerge as one of the sport's best by setting new one and four lap records to capture the coveted pole position. We shared the joy and excitement of Lynn St. James as she became only the second female in history to join the elite group of competitors. But all we have seen during the month of May is preliminary to what will be decided in a matter of three and a half hours. One person will experience the ultimate thrill of a lifetime. One person will claim the famous Borg Warner Trophy and have his or her image carved on it. But moreover, one person will claim the right to forever hold the title of winner. It's race day in Indianapolis. Now stay tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. And now here is the starting lineup for the 76 500 mile race as the green flag is about 38 minutes away. On the pole in car number 36, the Quaker State King Motorsports 1992 Lola Buick Roberto Guerrero, originally from Colombia, now living in San Juan Capistrano, California. In the middle of the front row, car number 9, the Target Scotch Video 92 Lola Ford Cosworth, driven by Eddie Cheever from Aspen, Colorado. The third starting spot, 1969 winner Mario Andretti from Nazareth, Pennsylvania. In the number 2, Kmart Texaco Newman Haas 92 Lola powered by a Ford Cosworth engine. Second row on the inside, 1990 Indy 500 winner Ari Leyendijk, originally from Holland, now living in Scottsdale, Arizona. He's driving the Target Scotch Video 92 Lola Ford Cosworth, car number six. Starting fifth is Gary Bettenhausen from Monrovia, Indiana, driving the number 51 Glidden Paints 92 Lola Buick. Outside the second row, defending national driving champion Michael Andretti from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, driving the K-Mark Texaco Newman Haas 1992 Lolo Ford Cosworth. The car number is one. In the third row, car number 22, the Amway Northwest Airline winning spirit 92 Lolo Buick, driven by Coldwater, Michigan, Scott Brayton. Next, the 85 winner, Danny Sullivan from Aspen, Colorado, driving the Molson Craco STP 92 Galmer, powered by a Chevy Indy V8A. The car number is 18. To his right, the defending champion, Rick Mears from Bakersfield, California, driving the Marlboro 92 Penske Chevy Indy V8B. Car number is 4. The fourth row on the inside, 86 winner Bobby Rahal from Dublin, Ohio. He'll be driving car number 12, the Miller Genuine Draft 92 Lola Chevy A. Next to him, Emerson Fittipaldi, originally from Brazil, now living in Miami, Florida. The car number 5, and the car is the Marlboro 92 Penske Chevy B. Completing the fourth row, the Valvoline 92 Galmer Chevy A, car driven by, number, uh, by Allenser Jr. from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the number is 3. Going to row number five, car number 91, the Jonathan Birds Cafeteria. Brian Heating and Cooling, WMCC 91 Lola Buick, driven by Stan Fox from Janesville, Wisconsin. In the middle of the fifth row is the Pennzoil 92 Lola Chevy 8, car number eight, driven by John Andretti from Indianapolis. 15th starting position, car number 19, the Royal Oak Charcoal, Mejak 90 Lola Buick, driven by Eric Bachelard from Brussels, Belgium. 
In row number six, rook rookie Philip Gosh from France driving the number 44 Formula Project. Roan Pooling Roar, 91 Lola Chevy A. Next to him, car number 10, the Budweiser Eagle, 92 True Sports Chevy A, driven by Scott Pruitt from Dublin, Ohio. Starting 18th is car number 93, DB Man Development, 1990 Lola Buick, driven by John Paul Jr. from West Palm Beach, Florida. On the inside of row number seven is rookie Paul Tracy from West Hill, Ontario, Canada, driving the number seven, Mobile One, 91 Penske Chevy A. In the middle of row seven is Jeff Andretti from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, driving car number 48, the Gillette, Carlo, Texaco, 91 Lola Chevy A. And outside row seven is the number 26, Quaker State King Motorsports, 92 Lola Buick, driven by Jim Crawford, originally from Scotland, now living in St. Petersburg Beach, Florida. Row number eight, car number 27, the Conseco 92 Lola Buick, driven by four-time winner Al Unzer from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Alongside another four-time winner, A.J. Foyt from Houston, Texas, driving the number 14 Copenhagen 92 Lola Chevy A. Outside row number eight is the number 21 leader card, 91 Lola Buick, driven by Buddy Lazier from Vail, Colorado. Starting 25th, Raul Boisel from Brazil in the number 11 Panasonic Sega 92 Lola Chevy A. In the middle of the ninth row, rookie Brian Bonner from Boston, Massachusetts. The number is 39, sponsored by Applebee's Danka. It's a 91 Lola Buick. Completing the ninth row is Lynn St. James from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She'll be driving the number 90 agency rent car J.C. Penney, Spirit of the American Woman, a 91 Lola Chevy A. The tenth row consists of the fastest rookie qualifier, Jimmy Vassar from Discovery Bay, California, in the number 47, Codalux, Hey Ho Cole, 91 Lola Chevy A. Number 68, Dominic Dobson from Fairfax, California, driving the Burns Racing Tobacco Free America Del Frisco's 91 Lola Chevy A. And Tom Sneva, the 1983 winner of the 500, driving the number 59, Menard Glidden Conseco 91 Lola Buick. Sneva lives in Paradise Valley, Arizona. Finally, in the last row, number 92, Gordon Johncock, a two-time Indy 500 winner in the STP Jacks Tool Riddle, Himmelgarn Racing 91 Lola Buick. From Los Angeles, California, Ted Prappas in the Say No to Drugs PIG Racing, number 31, 91 Lola Chevy A. And starting last, the number 15, McKenzie Financial, 92 Lola Chevy A, driven by Scott Goodyear from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Average speed of the field, 223.479, 4.8 miles an hour faster than last year. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the moment for the words we have been waiting to hear has arrived. And to give those words is Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Directors of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mrs. Mary Holman. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. And the command was just like it was in 1978 and 79 by Mary Fendry Coleman. And now the 33 cars fire to life. A huge roar has caught up along the main straightaway here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The drivers have received their final instructions. The crews are surrounding the cars. The crew chiefs have raised their hand into the air signifying that their car has started. The driver is all alone now and will be hopefully for another two hours and 45 or so minutes. Each one hoping that this can be his day, the day that he claims the greatest prize in all of auto racing, a win at the Indianapolis 500. There are very few people involved with these race cars and these race teams who do not have a racing heartbeat. Even we in the booth here at this very moment have a racing heartbeat because the emotion is so high at this great race. From a driver's point of view, now yes, they are alone, and now they begin to visualize and anticipate and hope for that, what that, about what that first corner or that first lap will be like hoping that they can stay out of trouble and not create trouble themselves. Remember, cold tires can be the enemy of the race cars in the, er in the early laps. 
the Cadillac Elante pace cars begin to pull away and the cars begin to pull away from their assigned positions. We'll wait to see if all 33 cars have been started. John Paul Jr. a little slow getting away as everyone else behind him appears to be in good shape. We do have one car that is down in the last row that apparently has not been started. We will wait on that. John Paul Jr. also toward the south end of the racetrack. Here comes Gordon Johncock. He's okay. That car is rolling. John Paul Jr. has not yet left the starting straightaway. And it appears as if they're wheeling the car backwards to possibly try to get it started again. So John Paul Jr. has not yet pulled away, but everyone else is rolling. The pace car heads down the main straightaway to begin the parade lap. We'll have this lap, one more, and then the start of the race. Let's swing around the track once again and bring in Jerry Baker in turn one. Well, Bob, I know we're supposed to be subservient to the chief announcer, but cool is not the word, baby. It is cold out here. I'm hanging midway through the first turn on a platform right under the upper deck. I can see the high price seats from below me and above me. Perfect view of the entire main straightaway. Complete look at the first corner as well as the short shoot. When they drop the green flag, this is the place to be. It's the best seat in the world. Not far across the way is Gary Lee with a great seat of things coming at them right now. Indeed, out on top, the Luxury Suites outside turn two. It is cold up here, too, but it's a kaleidoscope of color with neon pink and green and yellow caps. From my vantage point, I watch them scamper through the short shoot. They negotiate the nine degree banking here in turn two and head up the back stretch with race speeds of over 230 miles an hour, and they head right at you, Larry Henry, in turn three. A car, wait a minute, a car is off the track. The pole center, the pole car, Roberto Guerrero has spun off the track on the back stretch, making contact with the inside wall. Oh, this reminds me of Tom Stevens years ago, a problem on the back stretch on this parade lap. The cold tires, perhaps Derek Daly, perhaps you can amplify on that. But once again, as they were headed down the backstretch toward Larry Henry in turn three, about halfway down this five inch mile backstretch, Roberto Guerrero, the man with the one and four lap track records in the Quaker State car, spins off the track and makes contact with the inside wall. The safety crew is there now. Well, we would have to say yes in a situation that Roberto was in now. He's actually well out of the corner before he lost control of the car. When you stab these 700 horsepower cars, in fact, 800 horsepower in the case of a Buick because they have a lot more than the Chevrolet, they can very easily spin those rear wheels. And in fact, unfortunately, we see Roberto Guerrero actually getting out of his car. So his day is over. An unbelievable disappointment for the pulse at Roberto Guerrero. Turn four, Bob Lamy has a report. Yes, we've had another one, Bob, spin, and we'll get the number for you in just a moment, but another car has spun no contact. As a matter of fact, it is going to try to get restarted. Mu it is. That's uh, Philippe Gosh. He and uh, Lynn St. James car. Now, the car has stalled right in the middle of turn four. No contact that I could see. The crew's already there with him, but the car is right in the middle of the turn. So we're going to have a problem there, and I think Derek said it right on the head. Cold tires, very cold day and conditions they haven't run in. I think Larry Henry can uh, see something from where he is too in turn three. Yeah, I can see the car in turn four up against uh, between the outside retaining wall and the inside. Interesting about Roberto Guerrero. He is the one driver, the Buicks, the King Motorsports that have done the most testing in cold temperatures. In fact, I was talking with those people this morning. They had a book for the cold temperatures. They thought this was their day. They knew about the tire problem. They knew what it would take to get the tires warm. And somehow the car got away from Roberto Guerrero, who tested here, in, of course, in October and November and ran over 230 miles an hour in cold temperatures in March. So something may have happened to the car because they should have, they should have really known about the situation with that car. Now, the signal is being given by Dwayne Sweeney for one more lap, so perhaps we are now starting the pace lap, and let's swing around again. Turn one, Jerry Baker. Well, this changes things because now we, have, in effect, have no pole setter to take command of this field, and one of the things he wanted to watch was Mario and Michael Andretti. Michael is sitting right behind his dad. He has said that he will go where his dad goes. We expect that to be the real chase to take the lead in the first lap, Bob Jenkins. All right, and to turn two and Gary Lee as they pass by him. Well, as they head for turn two, I look at row four with two pass winners from Bobby Ray Hall and Emerson Fittipaldi. Al Enser Jr. outside that row may well be overdue for a victory. 
In row five, Stan Fox, John Andretti, and Eric Batchelar, the Belgium. And in row six, Philip Geish, Scott Pruitt, and John Paul Jr. The field now through turn two. They're heading up the backstretch, hopefully safely this time, as we'll go to Larry Henry. Well, they're bringing them down very slowly right now. Bobby Unser on board the pace car. Pace car lights are out, so we should go green this time around. Eddie Cheever in the middle of the front row has never led a lap here at Indianapolis. Mario Andretti on the outside. Michael right behind his dad. Look on the inside. Ari Leyendijk, a former winner here. And Gary Bettenhausen in a Buick. Rick Mears back on. Danny Sullivan. Al Unser Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Bobby Rahal. They're beginning to form up the field and head to the fourth turn. Let's cross our fingers, Bob Lamey. Okay, Larry, the pace car is coming in. They're coming through four. It is Cheever down low with Mario Andretti right behind him. Michael right behind him. The green is just about to come out the start. The 76th running of the 500. Here's Bob Jenkins. And the green flag is out. The race is on, and Eddie Cheever jumps into the lead as they head for one. Eddie Cheever takes the lead, and Michael Grant. Oh, Michael passed him on the inside. Michael Andretti in the short shoot out front with Mario right behind. It's an Andretti family reunion in turn two. Well below the white line as they come off the corner. The Andretti's one, two, and then it's Cheever, then it's Gary Bettenhausen in the Buick. Michael Andretti, very, very quick all month long. He's got about a 10-car length advantage. Then it's Mario Andretti, Cheever, Leyendijk. They're moving up in Gary Bettenhausen heading to four. Again, Michael Andretti. This is the smooth run all month. Michael way out in front, Mario behind him. Then it is Cheever, Leyendijk, Gary Bettenhausen. They head to the start finish line. Michael Andretti with a huge lead over his father, a position change for third. That's 178 laps now that Michael has led, and he is way out front in front of Gary Lee in turn two. In the engine department, it's Ford Cosworth, Ford Cosworth in the top four positions in the Buick Power Lola of Gary Bettenhausen, halfway down the backstretch into turn three. What a lead Michael Andretti has. We've got a stopwatch started on it, and already he has a four-second advantage over his father, Mario Andretti. He's already in four. Michael coasting, and you can't even find anybody until about four or five. Five seconds now Mario then it is again Leyendijk with Cheever, Bettenhausen and Scott Brayton. That's the order they're running as they come down the straightaway and now Leyendijk takes second. Leyendijk just really blew around with great ease. Mario Andretti and Leyendijk sets off in pursuit of Michael Andretti. These straightaways are five eighths of a mile long and right now Michael has almost a three-quarter straightaway lead over Ari Leyendijk. He is running an incredible race right now. Michael Andretti's already in four. Ari Leyendijk's just got here in three. There's Mario. There's Eddie Cheever. And Scott Brayton's moved up. Here in four, coming through four, we've got Leyendijk running second with Mario Andretti, then Cheever, then Brayton and Bettenhausen. But Michael Andretti's going to catch the back of the field quickly. Well, the pace begins to settle down now, and the cars begin to run in single-file formation. Let's back up and review for just a moment that incredible pass that Michael made on Eddie Cheever as they went into turn one, Derek. I can only think that it must have been Eddie Cheever's inexperience. He has never led a lap in through turn one here before. He backed off, and the Andretti's went either side of him. They knew a lot more about how fast you can drive these cars in the very early laps here, but Ari Leyendijk at the moment is flying. And Eddie Cheever has moved up a position, passing Mario Andretti. Here is Michael flashing by in the lead. He has a, almost an entire straightaway advantage over second place, Ari Leyendijk. Then in third is Cheever. Fourth is Mario. And fifth is Scott Brayton. So the race settling down now as the exciting opening laps have already taken place with Michael Andretti showing the way at an average speed of 223.2. Turn one, Jerry Baker. Eric Batchelard just blew an engine. He's in the short suit. He's going to be right in front of Gary Lee. The engine let go right back in front of us here. And very quickly, he is uh, off the pace. He is pulled out of the groove, coasting now to a stop. He is just outside the grass area. In the inside of turn two, the Royal Oak car, Eric Batchelar, the Belgium, the defending Indy Lights champion. He is still coasting. He is still on the racetrack. Moving very, very slowly, and we would look for him to pull off into the grass momentarily. A lot of smoke still spewing from the rear of that race car. We anticipate the caution flag coming out because there is no way that Eric Bachelart will make it around to the pit area. We pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network.
Meanwhile, the green is out in front of Gary Lee in turn number two. And right away, just as the first star of the race, Michael pulls away a big gap over Ari Leyendike, another big gap over his teammate Eddie Cheever, and running fourth now is Scotty Brayton. Scotty Brayton with a very, very good start here at the Indianapolis 500. He is closing right on the back side now of Eddie Cheever. So Scotty Brayton, Buick powered on board, one of the quicker cars out of the field right now. Michael Andretti through turn four, then it is Ari Leyendike, Eddie Cheever, Scott Brayton making a move, everybody else coming through four, all right, Bob. Three Ford Cosworths leading the way here in the opening laps, and we have a yellow in turn four. We've got a spin up here, one of the Glidden cars sliding back off the wall in turn four, down the main straightaway, and uh, getting by was Al Unser Sr., his teammate, but the slide comes closer to you, Robert. The car is uh, near the north end of the pit area. Perhaps Bob Forbes can tell us who it is. Bob, are you in a position to see the car? Steve. Bob Forbes, are you there? It's actually Tom Sneeve. We can see Tom still sits in that car. We're not sure we can see him moving. He takes out the steering wheel, but Tom Sneeve has hit the wall coming off four and very, very heavy damage to that Lola Buick. And there was a bunch of cars behind him. And as I looked up toward the north end of the racetrack, I was absolutely amazed at the amount of uh, skillful driving that was employed to get around that race car that was hitting the wall in turn number four and sliding down the main straightaway. Now let's go to Bob Forbes. Right down here, at one point, you might have seen it too, Bob, Sneva was coming down the main straightaway backwards. And he, uh, I didn't see what happened before that, but two or three different cars came close to hitting him. He has the car, of course, is stopped now. The uh, safety crew is there. They are trying to get him out of the car, and I think at this time, I'll say no more than that uh, until I can give you some more information. The second caution flag of the afternoon at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Back at the Indianapolis 500, and I believe now Michael has successfully lapped him. All right, Gary Lee? Indeed, coming through turn two, he is by M.O. Tucks in behind veteran Gary Bettenhausen. Three abreast going down turn into turn three. I can only call his driving style daring, very daring. Michael Andretti kept it to the low side of Gary Bettenhausen and had to slow down a little. That allowed M.O. to close up, but Michael with about a 10-car length advantage already on Emerson Fittipaldi. They come down to Main straightaway again. Fittipaldi has him, and uh, Michael right behind him in front of you, Bob. Indeed, Michael Andretti now going to the inside of Gary Bettenhausen in turn one. Tell you, Michael just goes anywhere he wants to. He's in heavy traffic. He starts to get one. He may pick off two. Back to you, Bob, of the tower. Backstretch caution flag. We've got a smoker coming down. The engine has let go. And let's check out the car. It's Gordon Johncock. Gordon Johncock has lost the engine. A puff of smoke all the way down the back straightaway. He got it down to the low side of the track. No spin. But his day is done, and we've got a yellow out on the track. And would you believe it? Emerson Fittipaldi missed the yellow flag by one lap. If the John Cox engine had blown one lap earlier, Fittipaldi could have made up all that complete lap length again. He missed it by about maybe 15 seconds. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Welcome back to live coverage of the 76th running of the 500-mile race. 65 laps are complete, and... Yellow into turn one, Jerry Baker. We've had a crash against the outside wall. Now another car clips him, and I cannot see who it is. It's right in the middle of the turn. Gary, have you got a better view than I do? The field glass is right now to look over there. I saw the car spin, a second car clipped him. I cannot make an ID on this car right now. 44 would be Philip Geish. And the other car that clipped him is Stan Fox in number 91. Stan Fox has come to a rest. Here in turn two, let's go back to Jerry Baker in turn one. Gary, the tire marks indicate that he was down below the white line. Now, I mentioned earlier, we're seeing very strange things in one. I've been here enough to know what to expect. I'm seeing cars, as Larry Henry talked about in number three, 
reporting themselves right down on the grassy area, but I've also seen them running completely above the white line. That's very unusual. What I see here, Gary Lee, are tire tracks and a complete loop that smacks the outside wall. He finishes up right in about the middle of the short shoot. Then he was clipped by Stan Fox, and now the... Uh, unit is out there. The safety guys are out there. They're back in single formation. What do you have for me again, Gary? Well, we can say as far as the Stan Fox fans, he is okay. He climbs out of a badly damaged car. The front nose, the, the foot box area ripped up. The right front ripped away, but he was very quick to climb out. He's talking to some emergency crew members. He lucked up to the grandstand here in the second corner, waited the fans, kind of brushed his hair after he took his helmet off, but Stan Fox is okay. So Philip Gosh remains in his ba very badly wrecked race car between turns number one and two. The other driver involved, Stan Fox, is out of his vehicle. And there is so much carnage down there now between turns one and two because Philippe Gosh hit so hard. It's very difficult to speculate in a situation like this as to what happened. But remember, we just came off yellow. Philippe Gosh was just in the pits, got new tires. So if I was to make a guess, I would say again, it's this cold tire situation that catches the driver out when he's under hard uh, and, and full speed into turn one on the opening lap after the green. And because there's so many, uh, so much shrapnel down there, the, there was a traffic jam of cars. There was about five or six of them came through. It's amazing that they didn't stall. It looked like they couldn't have been going five miles an hour. I thought that some of them may stall, but uh, Derek, evidently, they can go slower and get going uh, than I thought they could. And a huge traffic jam as the green comes out and they head for turn one, Jerry. Here they come and there they go. Ari Lyons like trying to make up some ground and boy, I'll tell you what, Michael Andretti's got that baby in tune, hasn't he, Gary? Another crash. They got another crash in two. Another one hits the wall. Three, four, five We've got cars, cars involved. Crawford. A number of cars involved across the south short shoot. Once again, perhaps called tires on the restart. We see one of the Penske cars involved. Emerson Fittipaldi. Emerson Fittipaldi is one of those involved in the crash. We'll wait to find out who the other driver involved. Jerry, can you see it? I can't, I, I can't see the first one, Bob, because actually the first crash happened prior to Fittipaldi hitting the wall. And the crash marks that we saw just moments ago with car 44 are about maybe 50, 60 feet west or, or into the turn earlier than where Fittipaldi smacked the outside wall. Now, I think I can see Fittipaldi getting out of his car. He appears to be okay. The other car is sitting on the infield grass closer to where Gary Lee is located. We have so many emergency guys standing around, I cannot even positively identify the, uh, the driver. Let's go to Sally Larvik, who is in uh, the uh, pit of Jim Crawford with Kenny Bernstein. Kenny, I didn't want to see you in this situation again. And he just turned around and he, he smiled, that great smile of his, and shook his head. It's like it's just not your day today. No, you know, sometimes that happens in motorsports. It's not your day. Uh, we've been there in all forms of it, so we're used to it. It's no fun. We don't like it. But, uh, you know, guys are trying hard. That's all you can do. Did you have any indication at all? Was there a problem with Crawford's car? We don't know exactly why the accident occurred, but up until this point, how was his car running? No, everything was fine. We were chasing a little bit of a chassis push situation, but not anything badly. He was able to live with it. Looked to me like they had three or four of them just went into the corner there pretty hard and probably ran out of room is what I would assume happened. And you'll be happy to hear, if you don't know already, that Crawford is out of the car and he is walking around. Yeah, I heard him on the radio. He said he was okay, so we're glad for that. That's the most important thing. Okay, Kenny, we're so sorry, and we'll see you here next year, I'm sure. I sure hope so. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Back to Bob. All right, let's regain our composure here. Three cars were involved in the incident. Two of them are of the Roger Penske team, Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi, both involved in the crash, and Roberto, or rather, Jim Crawford. Now, Crawford, we did see gingerly rise out of the car. He appeared to be okay, although obviously will be checked over at the infield medical center. And we saw also uh, Rick Mears sitting on the edge of his car. And a very scary situation for Jim Crawford and Rick Mears. They are two of the drivers who have already had severe foot and leg injuries. And to make this hard a contact um, after this uh, green flag situation, they're still working on Rick Mears. He's sitting by the side of his car. He is okay. But Jim Crawford, as you mentioned, very, very slowly out of his car and walking, limping away. Bob, I find this extraordinary. Although the potential for a multi-car accident is always there, normally we will see two cars. It's rare that we see three. The other thing is that when there are several cars involved, 
very often you can have a veteran driver, a potential winner, tangle with a back marker. What we have here is three cars that are out of the race, and all three of them very strong contenders for victory. We now see Emerson Fittipaldi out of his car. He is sitting down on the stretcher. He appears to be not seriously injured. All three drivers involved in this crash, Rick Mears, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Jim Crawford, will be checked over at the Enfield Hospital. In just a moment, here comes the green flag. Michael Andretti with a huge lead. And a crash in turn four, Bob. Yes, it involves Mario Andretti. It's some good driving by Buddy Lazier to get by. Same with Dominic Dobson. Again, spin coming off four. Mario makes contact into the wall. Virtually the same spot that Tom Sneva did. He slides to a stop in the area headed to the pits, but about halfway between turn four and the pit area. The first vehicle right to him. Mario still in the car. The guy's talking to him right now and uh, checking around to make sure it looks like some heavy damage on the left side of the car, Bob. Uh, spin coming off four and into the wall. Mario Andretti, car number is two. Bob Jenkins. I have been coming to this race since 1960. I have made missed two years since then, and I have never seen anything like this, Derek. Uh, this is the first time <laughs> I've ever been in the radio broadcast booth. I have never <laughs> seen anything like this as a race driver in participation in races like this or in a situation calling a race. It is phenomenal. We can only, I mean, we talk about it all the time. It has to be the weather conditions. What amazes me now, it's the big names, the experienced people who are falling foul of this difficult situation when the green flag flies again after cleaning up one incident, we, uh, we have another one. But Mario is still in his car. With that in mind, Derek, I think a tip of the hat to Buddy Lazier and Dominic Dobson, who both did an extraordinary job of escape and evasion to miss that accident. Howdy, we will get back with you in just a moment as you complete your 80-lap rundown. We are in caution period number six. This for a crash involving Mario Andretti in turn four. Now stay tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. The green flag has just come out, restarting the 76 Indianapolis 500 from our sixth caution flag of the afternoon. It is Michael Andretti that is leading this race over Eddie Cheever. Those two cars are on the same lap as the leader now approaches turn number four and Bob Lamy. All of them coming through absolutely clear, but Bob, what you do, you have to do is check the entire field as they come through. The tires seem to be doing all right through four this time. Everybody is safe through and on into one. Michael being very cautious, however, as he heads to turn one and Jerry Baker. Right in front of us, he does get himself right on that white line in beautiful position. He's already in number two, and Jerry Lee's got him. I don't know if you can tip toe at 200 miles an hour, but that's exactly what these guys are doing now. With that last lap, we saw him actually down into three going four abreast. Can you believe that? On cold tires. It was a little scary at that time, I'll tell you. Michael Andretti trying to get around Ari Leyendijk and uh, put him a lap down in this race. He's doing that job. Michael seems to have it back under control again. He comes right in front of us in turn four, and everybody again following suit all the way through. Everyone clear, and uh, we keep going, and the light is green. We have had some phenomenal wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing here. We have had two and three abreast between the short shoots and down this back straight, but Michael Andretti made a lunge at Ari Leyendijk on the lap previously, didn't get the job done and fell back about seven or eight car lengths. Now he's just trying to get by Bozell to try and work his way back up to Leyendijk. Michael Andretti has dominated the Indianapolis 500 so far today, not only in terms of a powerful race car and the Ford Cosworth engine, but in terms in terms of avoiding the crashes that we have seen take out many veterans, including his father, Mario Andretti. Now, to recap what has happened so far, Roberto Guerrero, the pole sitter of this race, crashed on the parade lap before the yellow green flag ever came out. Guerrero was eliminated from competition. We have had numerous crashes involving Tom Sneva, involving Philip Gosh, Stan Fox, Jim Crawford, Rick Mears, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Mario Andretti. The only driver that we know that is in Methodist Hospital at the moment was Tom Sneva, who was reported in good condition when he left the infield medical center here at the Speedway, but is being checked over in Methodist Hospital. Michael Andretti is the leader of the race and running in second spot now, about six seconds behind, is Eddie Chief. Eddie Cheever having a very, very good day here. Uh, the Ford engine still continue to dominate, but as we watch out here, it's still Leyendijk trying to stay ahead of Michael Andretti, trying to get another yellow flag situation that he can take advantage of. 
Larry Henry in turn three. We've got an engine that has gone just as they came through the turn, and it is Scott Brayton. His engine is gone. Smoke coming out of the back. The yellow back on the race course for a blown engine. And yet another yellow flag comes out from starter Dwayne Sweeney for the seventh time this afternoon. This one is for a blown engine, or at least a huge amount of smoke coming from the number 22 car of Scott Brayton. He's well off the track on the apron, headed for the pit area. Three drivers benefited from this caution period, Derek. A huge break for Bobby Rahal, Alan Sir Jr. and Ari Leyendijk. They were running ahead of Michael Andretti when that yellow flag came out. Of course, they pick up the leader. Everybody else ahead of him gets to go all the way around and make up that lap. So a big break. Ray Hall on Sir Jr. and Ari Leyendijk. And the green flag has come out once again, but there's a car very slowly down in turn one, Jerry. It is smoking right in front of us here, and that is Tracy. Number seven, Paul Tracy. We've got a crash in one again. Somebody has tagged the outside wall. Almost identical to where Fittipaldi hit it just seconds ago. And now directly in front of me is the car number seven. I mentioned the rookie, Paul Tracy. Let's check number two. Gary Lee, can you see who that is? We're getting a report. It's uh, apparently the rookie, Jimmy Vassar, from California, made hard contact on the outside wall as he was coming off turn one. His car is now sitting in the grass between turns one and two, and so another crash here has interrupted the proceedings. What we need here, Bob, is we need that Cadillac Elante pace car to do the last pace up at about 180 or 90 miles an hour, which is impossible because, for sure, again, this cold tire phenomenon is causing absolute grief to these drivers and cars and let's hope we don't have drivers being injured or badly hurt because of this situation. Let's go quickly to Chuck uh, Marlowe back in the uh, garage and hospital area. Okay, well, we are, we're back here right now. Dr. Bach has walked away. This man, needless to say, is exceedingly busy, but he's coming over and has a prepared statement. We we're going to have to back things up. Bob Walters, who is uh, Director of Public Relations here, is trying to get everybody arranged so that Dr. Bach can uh, make his statement. First of all, Tom Sneva has been released from Methodist Hospital in good condition. He has no injuries. Jim Crawford is on his way to Methodist Hospital with an injury to his left foot for x-rays. He's awake and alert. Rick Mears is on his way to Methodist Hospital with an injury to his left knee and uh, for some x-rays of his feet. Emerson Fittipaldi is on his way to Methodist Hospital for some x-rays of his left knee where he sustained a puncture wound. Uh, all of these drivers are awake and alert and, and seem to be in good condition at this time. That is a report from Dr. Henry Bach, the medical director at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Our attention now focuses on turn number one, where Jim Vassar has crashed. We will have a recap of that crash and bring you the latest from turn number one in a moment on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway radio network. We are about to go back to green flag racing at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The field is now moving through the north end of the racetrack between turns three and four. Here comes the leader of the race, Michael Andretti, off of the fourth corner, and he looks at the green flag. It is waving, and the race is on once again. Here comes Michael Andretti headed for turn number one and another crash in turn four. Bob Lamey. Yes, we've got a spin, and Brian Bonner, the car number is 39. It was Jim Crawford's backup again into the wall, again heavy to Bree here in turn four as he spins coming on and just before that the uh, leader Michael Andretti went through and there was a group of four or five Al Unser Jr. was involved in that Brian Bonner uh, helping himself get out of the cockpit he seems to be okay the crew getting to him very very quickly he is helping himself get out making sure that everything is undone he begins to climb out of the uh, cockpit as the second truck rolls up and again, Bob, the one thing, even with all the yellows, I'm amazed at how quickly these crews are here, how well they do their job, and how, how very, very accurate they are and good getting to these people on time. Again, Brian Bonner sitting uh, in the cockpit right now, trying to exit the car. He wants to. They want, to sit, want him to sit there just a moment. But Brian Bonner, the car number is 39, and into the wall in turn four, I, almost again, where Sneva and Mario Andretti have, have made contact already. 
Unfortunately, these safety crews have been the busiest men in the whole arena this afternoon. And Bob Lamy, you make a very good point. These safety trucks are actually on the roll and moving very often be before these crash race cars ever come to a standstill. And from a driver's point of view, that's a very comfort comforting situation. You never want to get into the wall here, but if you do, you know you're in very good and very experienced hands with these safety people. We see Brian Bonner has extricated himself from the race car. He is sitting on it, being checked over by the medical personnel. He does not appear to be seriously injured. As the field now very slowly makes its way into turn number three, and we are anticipating the uh, resumption of this race. According to the uh, score sheet here, it is uh, Allenser Jr. who is leading this race with Bobby Rahal second, followed by Michael Andretti. In fourth position is Eddie Cheever, and fifth is Ari Leyendijk. And we are looking now for the resumption of this race. The crowd rises to its feet, and the green flag is out once again. And here they come down the main straightaway. It is Al Unser Jr. leading as they head for turn number one. Al Unser Jr. out in front. There is Jr. There is Bobby Rahal in the short suit. So far, so good. Here's Gary Lee. Well, of course, his daddy has won the race. His uncle has won the race. But Al Jr. is looking for his first victory, and he leads the parade halfway down this back stretch. It has been a struggle all month long for Al Unser Jr., but right now he's in the lead, but Michael Andretti's on the move. He just gets past Danny Sullivan. Michael Andretti's got the pedal to the metal, and he's moving up. Al Unser Jr. coming toward four. Several cars in front of him as he tries to make a move, and Michael Andretti goes around. Al Jr. down the main straightaway, Bob. Indeed, Michael Andretti picks up the lead again as they head again for turn number one. At one point, they were three abreast. There goes Michael Andretti. Once he gets clear sailing, Bob, he is tough to catch. Michael Andretti has reassumed command of this race, and now we wait and see if we can run five laps under green and get a winner of the halfway challenge. tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, 113 laps completed in the 500-mile race, and Michael Andretti is the leader, but Bobby Rahal has made an unscheduled pit stop. Chris McClure. Had a flat left rear, so they went tires all the way around, did fuel it up, and he is back out. A very brisk pit stop, although an unscheduled pit stop, but they got him back out as quick as they could. And now five laps have been completed under the green past the halfway point. And so the winner of the $10,000 to that halfway challenge driver award is Michael Andretti, who was leading the race at the halfway lap or on lap 114. Another crash in turn number two. Jeff Andretti, Jeff Andretti came through two, out of shape, a half spin, another car involved to the inside. Gary, Gary. Gary Bettenhausen. Apparently got some debris. We're over in turn two. First of all, to recapitulate, Jeff Andretti with hard contact coming off the second corner. He slides down the back straightaway. Gary Bettenhausen got involved, made contact to the inside of the wall. And Larry Hendry in turn number three has an observation on this. I think Gary Bettenhausen got involved. A wheel came off of the Andretti car, went up in the air, and clipped Gary Bettenhausen down on the inside. I'm not sure where the tire came down, but we saw it coming across the track. It got Gary, and then he hit on the inside retaining wall. So it was an airborne tire that came down near Gary Bettenhausen's car, causing that part of the accident. An unbelievable Indianapolis 500-mile race. Unprecedented, I would say, in the history of this classic automobile event that has been held for 76 years. Gary Bettenhausen has climbed out of his car, exiting turn number two. They continue to see if Jeff Andretti is going to be able to get himself out of the car. Let's go back to Gary Lee in turn number two. Well, once again, it was Jeff Andretti coming through the corner, did a spin to the wall, made very hard contact. Uh, debris, uh, just like shrapnel exploding as uh, these cars do so often when there is contact. And as Larry Henry indicated, apparently, apparently a tire got into Gary Bettenhausen, but we can see that Gary from Monrovia, Indiana, has climbed out of that car. That's the Menard car, the Glidden car. He is okay, but the crew is still working down there with the Jeff Andretti. He is driving as a teammate to A.J. Foyt. So once again, a most unusual Indianapolis 500. Still very cold, and but we're not really sure that it was perhaps a cold tire problem there, but we can see there's a lot of debris here on the outside of turn two. 
and Chris McClure is down in the Glidden pit. With owner John Menard, and John, you have been in contact with Gary. Is he okay, first of all? Yeah, he's fine. He uh, spun, and uh, the tire is bent up, the wheel's bent up. Uh, someone spun in front of him, and he had to avoid him. He just got collected. He got collected in the deal. It's been quite a day. Michael Andretti has virtually dominated this race since the green flag dropped. He put a tremendous move on Eddie Cheever going into turn number one at the drop of the green flag. Michael is in his ninth Indianapolis 500-mile race, and, of course, his best finish was just last year when he finished right behind Rick Mears, who won his fourth Indy 500. And Michael keeps going faster and faster here. His last lap was a 226.5 miles an hour. To give you a comparison, Lion Dyke's last lap was in the 221 mile an hour range. Michael, totally dominant. He has stretched out his lead to a little over five seconds over Ari Lion Dyke. Running in third spot is Al Unzer Jr., about 13 seconds behind. Fourth is Al Unzer Sr. And then running in fifth position, the last car on the lead lap is Scott Goodyear. Everybody else is at least one lap down. At the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, we're working lap 135 of the 76th running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Michael Andretti is the pace setter, the dominant car so far in the event. He is the leader. We're in the pits with Gary Bettenhausen, who just a little while ago was eliminated from the competition as he was collected in an accident over in turn two. First of all, Gary, you look to be fine. Have you got any bumps that uh, you need to talk about? No, just my... You know, I got bumps in my race car on the left front suspension a little bit, I guess. Uh, well, Jeff Andretti spun, hit the wall, and uh, one of his front tires came out of the sky and, and got me in the left front suspension. About your race up to that point, of course, a lot of folks are talking about the cool temperatures, difficulty getting heat into the tires, and that perhaps a reason for a good many of these crashes here today. How was yours going? My car was perfect. Uh, just before a crash was the best it was all day. We had a little understeer early, and we just kept working. Now we have a crash in turn really number four. Uh, Bob Lamy. Four and make it Ari Leyendijk. This time who came high out of turn four, brushed the wall, and then made more contact and slid down toward the main straightaway. The car number is six, Ari Leyendijk. Another one into wall in turn four. Bob. Sorry to interrupt you, Chris McClure, on your interview with Gary Battenhausen. We're glad that he is okay. Ari Leyendijk has crashed coming out of turn number four. The car has come to a rest well down the straightaway. And now, once again, those safety crews go to work quickly to make sure that Ari is in good shape. Another caution period, the 11th of the afternoon at Indianapolis. A disastrous situation for Ari Leyendijk. He was giving it everything he had in pursuit of Michael Andretti. Ari's lap speeds were in the 221, 222 mile an hour range. But Michael Andretti did a lap speed of 227.8 miles an hour. Pulling away from Ari. Ari just went a little bit over the top. And that's the end of his day. It looks as if he is okay. The foot box of the car is intact. It is in good shape. They're working on Ari at the moment to get him out of the car. It is a slow process. Remember, these safety workers make sure that you're in good physical condition before they attempt to take you out of the car. So the doctors are with him at the moment, checking him over, but we do expect and hope that Ari is, in fact, okay. Sally Larvick is in the uh, Ganassi pit with the Tom Anderson. Sally? Can everybody else stay here to help Eddie? Okay, Tom is giving some last-minute directions. It must be really disappointing for you because he had such a good run. Do you know what happened? No, I don't. Right now, the, my only concern is Ari's safety. And he, I was talking to him on the radio. He said he was fine. He was okay. I heard him talking to the medical people. They were over there to assist him. So Ari's our number one concern right now. And uh... At the front of the pack, as the field comes around to take the green flag, will be A.J. Foyt. He is running in 10th position, four laps down. But A.J. has the distinction of leading the others back to the green flag, and it will come out on lap number 142. The leader of the race is Al Unzer, Jr. Second place is his father, Al Sr., then Scott Goodyear, Michael Andretti, and Bobby Rahal. And here they come three wide down the front stretch as they head for turn number one. Well, things are really dicey in there right now. There goes Al Jr. There's Ray Hall. There is Al Sr. A.J. Foyt shows the way through number two. And right behind A.J. Foyt is Al Jr. And he gathers Foyt up, headed down that back stretch. So it won't be long before 
Al Jr. will make a pass, perhaps to the inside, going into turn three. And there he goes to the inside of A.J. Foyt. Four wide down the back straightaway. Al Sr. trying to get below Michael Andretti again. Michael gets the position on the move, but they were four wide heading to three. In four, it's Al Jr. coming through first. And Foyt, Ray Hall, Boisel, everybody coming through all clean as they head to the start-finish line, Bob. Al Unzer Jr. stretches the advantage just a little bit over the second place, Michael Andretti. This is reminiscent of what Michael had ready during early on in the race. He has now got some breathing room as they head toward the back straightaway. Yeah, but there are one, two, three, four, five cars now between first and second. Five cars separating Little Al and Michael as they head for turn three. It's the Gomer with the Chevy. It's the Lola with the Ford, and Michael Andretti is in deep traffic behind Raul Boisel. He can't get past the car. Boisel's actually blocking Michael as they go to four. Al Hunter has already gone through. Ray Hall, it's Foyt coming through, and now Michael Andretti has made his move into the middle of the pack. They head down toward number one and Jerry Baker. Here comes little Al. Here comes the rest of the pack, and there goes Michael Andretti. So it's just that much room. It's about a quarter of a mile. They're already on the back straight away. A turn actually separates Little Al from Bobby Rahal, but still three cars now between first and second position. And once again, working traffic down the back stretch. Michael Andretti heads for turn three. And take a look. Al Unser is staying right with Michael Andretti. Al is not losing a lot of ground at this point. He's got the Buick engine on board, but he's keeping Michael Andretti inside. And they're all widely separated as they come through for the same order as they head toward the start-finish line. Two Unzers and an Andretti. Derek, it takes you back many years here at the Speedway. Well, that's right, indeed. Very famous names here. But let me tell you one thing. Michael Andretti is so aggressive in traffic, he has everything to lose by being too aggressive. He has the fastest car combination in the race. He really has to take his time. But there is a phenomenal traffic jam halfway down this back straight almost every lap. Here's Larry Henry in three. Al Unser! Al Unser has passed Michael Andretti! Al Unser now! has passed Michael Andretti, the Buick power. There's something going wrong with Michael's car. He is a lot slower than Al Unser now. Still has him in four. Michael Andretti trails. They both stay out. Al Unser moves toward the start-finish line, having passed Michael Andretti. They come by us, and indeed, Al Senior has about a four-car length advantage on third place, Michael. Well, he went by him with great fashion. Now it looks like Michael's found some speed as they hit into number two. About five car lengths now between those two. They work off the second corner. Hustle down this back stretch. Speeds exceeding 230 miles an hour as they head for Larry Henry in turn three. Michael setting him up goes to the low side. Michael Andretti down low. Gets Sal Lancer back. And that time, no mistake by Michael Andretti. He's got the position back. But little Al has Bobby Rahal between them as Michael Andretti leads Al Senior through four and down the main straightaway. Bobby Rahal is running in fifth position. He is a lap down. There are four cars on the lead lap and a great battle up front as Al Unzer Jr. has the lead. Michael is second. Third is Al Sr. And fourth is Scott Goodyear. And with just over 50 laps to go, a whole new sprint race breaks out because Al Unzer Sr. and Michael Andretti are still together on the back straight. Turn one and uh, turn number two, Gary Lee. Well, we see a car approaching very slowly. That is Buddy Lazare in car 21. Buddy Lazare, the youngster coasting off the second corner very slowly down the backstretch. So this could cause a caution as that number 21 car of Buddy Lazare has smoke pouring from it and is going slowly down the backstretch. But the green remains out at the moment. And the race continues with Unzer, Andretti and Unzer, the first three at 148 laps. Michael did Michael did make a pit stop not too long ago. That's what put him back behind these cars now. But Al Unzer Jr. is still leading the race and running very strongly. And we are under caution. Larry in turn three. Yeah, Buddy Lazier pulled it down to the inside of the track. If he had gone about another 100 yards or so, he could have turned it in where the safety trucks were. In fact, the crowd up here was pointing down to where the exit was off the track to get him off here so they could stay green. But he pulled it into the grass, and now there's some smoke coming from there, so maybe there was a fire on board. Maybe that's why he's now jumped out of the car, got a little bit of a hot seat, and he's kind of patting himself around so there may have been an onboard fire as Buddy Lazier does a little bit of a dance on the back straightaway. Indeed he is uh, obviously very warm in his seat but he is out of the car and apparently okay. Chuck Marlowe is in the Hanny Emergency Medical Center area. 
Well, we're picking up some of the reports right now. Let's see if we can get Dr. Bach to repeat them in just a moment. He suffered uh, severe injuries to both of his feet and to his ankles, uh, the extent of which we won't know until we see his x-rays. Ari Leyendijk uh, will be um, released momentarily if he hasn't been out here already. He has a bruise to his, uh, to his right foot, but other than that, he's in good condition. Dr. Bach, would you re please repeat Jeff's condition? Uh, Jeff and Andretti is in fair condition. He has a concussion as well as some severe fractures that appears to his feet and to his legs. All right, thank you very much. That's the report from down here, Bob. Jeff Andretti, another victim of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in this 76th running of the 500. We are a little late. In fact, we are several minutes late, but let's pause now for station identification. This is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network. Race leader Michael Andretti has just made his pit stop. He got tires all the way around in a full load of fuel, and it took a little bit longer than earlier in the race because they had to wait for the fuel, but it was very clean, and he was away. He got 34 laps on that segment. Let's go to Sally Larvick. And the crew is waiting patiently for Al Unser Jr. to come in. As we mentioned, last time he was in, they did not change tires. This time they have to, only they are only changing three tires. Checking the fourth tire, the uh, left front tire, making sure it's okay, and it is. Put the fuel in. It looks like a routine stop. No problem at all. The car is down off the jacks, and Al Unser Jr. is off. And Al Unser Sr. has picked up the lead of the Indianapolis 500-mile race, but he will need a pit stop before too long. He will need a pit stop, which will put him back a little bit, but Al Unser Jr. badly needed that stop on those tires because he was actually falling off the pace and uh, doing lap speeds around the 216-mile-an-hour range. So he badly needed those new tires. Brian uh, Hammonds has a report in the Scott Goodyear pits. It was an uneventful pit stop for Scott Goodyear. Four new tires, a full load of fuel, a great stop by the team. And in fact, when they finished, the crewmen were throwing their fists into the air, trying to entice the crowd into getting in behind Scott Goodyear. Now let's go to Chuck Marlowe. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Ted Prapp is with us right now. 138 laps. Looked pretty good for a while. What happened, Ted? Uh, something just went away in the gearbox there. We, uh, yeah, I mean, it was running good. We did what we were trying to do, just kind of stay out of all the trouble we figured was going to happen and, uh, you know, try to be a little conservative on the car and everything. And, um, you know, it was going good. Everything was working fine. The pit stops, I think, and everything went good. And we just finally, we came into pit. And when we tried to leave, we couldn't find anything but fifth and sixth gear. And then we got running again, and fifth and sixth were fine. And then when it came yellow again, we came back in to try to see if we could fix it. And uh, then all of a sudden, all we could get was first gear, and we couldn't get anything higher than that. So we couldn't run like that. Have you enjoyed your first experience? Hi, yeah, I, it was, you know, it was nerve-wracking in practice and qualifying. Then we made the show, and it was nerve-wracking before the start of the race. But the race was good. I mean, you know, everything was kind of going the way we planned it, and we were moving up, and... Okay, well, Ted, thank you very much, Ted. Continue good fortunes. Thank you. Allen's are senior. The lead of the race comes in, and Chris McClure is there to call his pit stop. He slowly glides into his pit stall, puts it on the markers. The air jack goes in, and he's up in the air. The pit stop is underway. The fuel going in. Will Michael Andretti get around, followed by Scott Goodyear before Al Unser Sr. can get back onto the racetrack. Al Sr. is still up, waiting for the fuel. The tires are done. He is down, trying to get away. A little hesitation, slight hesitation, another hesitation, 50 feet up the track, but now he's underway and into turn number one. And Al Unser Jr. has gone by, so I believe we will check the standings as Al Unser Sr. builds up speed coming out of turn number one and into now turn number two. They must stay below a white line all the way around turns one and two and then blend in with the field as he enters the backstretch. And the opening laps when you come out of a pit stop are very, very important. How fast you can build up that speed to not lose precious time, but then you fall back into the situation where cold tires have caught out so many people earlier today. Now Bobby Rahal has caught right up behind Al Unser, but Unser is up to speed and looks to be able to handle Ray Hall. Allen's or senior has made his final pit stop as have many of those running in the lead lap and there are four at the moment. So the pace slowing down just a little bit as Bobby Ray Hall comes in for a pit stop. Bobby Ray Hall who was shown in the top 10 and Chris McClure is there to call the pit stop of Bobby. 
And he's going for fuel only. They don't even put it up on the jack, so they're going to time the fuel as it goes in. Bobby Rahal waiting patiently. They clear some debris away from the radiators. Bobby Rahal now has the hose away, and he is away from the pit. 180 laps completed. 20 to go in the Indianapolis 500. Many people choosing Bobby Rahal to win this race because he had the tried and true and proven Indy V8A. However, it has been the Ford Cosworth that has dominated this Indianapolis 500. It really has. And in second place, it has been Scott Goodyear who has been the major surprise of the afternoon to come from as far back on the grid as he has come with one of the smaller teams on the uh, that chases the IndyCar World Series here. Scott Goodyear has really replaced Ray Hall as the Chevrolet runner who really has given the Fords most trouble today. We have now completed 185 laps. There are 15 to go in the Indianapolis 500-mile race, and a battle is shaping up for second position as Scott Goodyear and Al Unser Jr. are battling on the racetrack. They're headed for turn number three. Larry? Well, Al Unser Jr. has closed down on Scott Goodyear. It's about a 10-car length advantage right now from the young man from Canada. But Al Unser Jr. may have finally found some speed, or maybe Scott Goodyear is having a little handling problem right now. Hunter Jr. making a move, closing some ground as they head to the start-finish line. Here they come, and it is still Goodyear maintaining that second position by several car lengths over Al Unzer Jr., so Scott holds on to the spot by about a second and a half. Definitely a pressure cooker situation here for Scott Goodyear. When he looks in his mirror, sees Al Unzer Jr. getting larger and larger in those mirrors. Uh, Goodyear's last lap was 2.13, so he may be slowing down. Larry in turn three. They are side by side, Al Jr. down on the low side. He's got the position, he gets by Scott Goodyear. It may not be enough, but at least Al Jr. now holds second position in this race. Three to four, it's Al Jr. who is pulling away now from Scott Goodyear as they head to the start finish line. Al Unser Jr. has, however, about a 25 second deficit to make up. Michael Andretti is the leader of this race. Michael Andretti leads by about 27 and a half seconds now over Al Unser Jr. Michael Andretti, I think, is in well, well in control of this race. He is backed off to laps in the 222 mile an hour range. Now remember, he has a lot more fuel on board right now, which does slow him down. But it does appear that Michael is controlling the pace, running just as fast as he needs to. And the pace is about 221 miles an hour. And Larry, is he slowing down? Michael Andretti, the leader, is slowing down, coming down the back straightaway. Oh, my goodness. Michael Andretti going slowly, heading down to the inside. Unbelievable. Michael Andretti, the engine, we can barely hear it. Michael Andretti, your leader that's dominated, is slowing down. That'll put Al Unser Jr. into the lead. Michael and Indianapolis 500. Unbelievable luck for the Andrettis at Indianapolis. Mario crashed out earlier today. Jeff Andretti also crashed. And now Michael Andretti is stalled at the entrance to turn number four. Meanwhile, on the racetrack, a great battle for the lead as Allenzer Jr. has serious contention from Scott Goodyear as they head for turn one. Here they come. It is Al Unser right in front. He's got even in the short shoot. It's Al Unser Jr. We got a yellow light back to you, Bob. We are yellow, of course, because of Michael Andretti's stalled car in turn number four. Sandy Andretti, the wife of Michael can't believe it, and many, many race fans gathered here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and listening and watching around the world can't believe it. Michael has come to within about 14 laps of winning the race, and it's over. How many times does it happen in racing when your fortunes totally change around? Michael Andretti had everything he needed, the perfect car, the perfect combination, and yet it wasn't to be his day. But there's only seven laps to go, eight laps to go, and a sprint race is about to break out here. Let's go to Chris McClure in the pit area. Well, most of Michael Andretti's crew still leaning over the wall, staring somewhat dumbfounded up the racetrack. The fueler, the Trevor Weston, has his head bowed, sitting next to the fuel tank. 
at the other side, climbing off the timing tower already. Sandy Andretti along with Carl Haas, one of the owners. The Ford people on hand shaking their heads. It's a devastated scene down here as they turn away from the racetrack. Let's Sally Larvick. Okay, and I am down here in Rick Gallus's pit, and you can imagine the elation. Rick, how are you feeling right now? I just soon wait a minute. Okay, Rick is, as you can imagine, Rick is a little bit nervous, and so we'll wait with him as he uh, waits to see what happens. Michael Bob? Andretti has gotten out of his car, and Larry Henry is in turn number three. Well, there was no smoke from the car, such as an engine going, but Michael Andretti stayed within the machine for quite a while. They finally pushed it by hand, and then he climbed out, kept the helmet on. A couple of workers went out and tried to console him. Michael now with the helmet off and just walking dejectedly back and forth inside of the fourth turn. Michael had this race in hand, and something has gone wrong with his car. He had led 163 laps, but it's all over. And we said it earlier, if Scott Goodyear or anybody else was to win, Michael would have to have a problem or a mechanical failure. Well, it has happened within 10 laps, within 10 laps of the checkered flag, and it's all over for the complete Andretti family. With the field bunching up now and with Al Unser in the lead lap, we wonder about the ability of that V6 Buick to outpull Scott Goodyear on the restart and the possibility of a father and son finishing first and second. And Brian Hammonds has a report on pit road. One person's bad luck is another person's good fortune. Here in Scott Goodyear's pits, the crowd is going crazy. The crew is going crazy. They're setting in second place with just eight laps remaining here at Indianapolis. And Derek Walker, the team owner, is trying to calm the crew down, saying, hey, it's not over yet, fellas. We still have some laps to go racing. Indeed we do. This completes lap number 191, so still nine laps to go. And Donald, I'll jog your memory here concerning Canadian race drivers and the possibility of one here today. Uh, well, golly, there haven't been that many in the race. Uh, Sc uh, uh, Billy Foster, we recall. Eldon Rasmussen, we recall. But uh, uh, Scott Goodyear, in fact, was 10th as a rookie a couple of years ago. And I'm not too sure that, that, that he wasn't the only Canadian in the top ten. So he's certainly going to top that by, by the looks of it here. Well, the Gillette Company, makers of the Gillette Sensor Shaving System, the revolutionary razor that adjusts to the contours of your face and right guard antiperspirant and deodorant for maximum protection against wetness and odor, is pleased to announce that Marianne Ward of Kittery, Maryland, has won the beautiful Chevrolet Corvette in the Gillette Halfway Challenge. Congratulations to her. Now, the... Uh, pace car lights are out. Larry Hendry, they're heading toward you, and we're set up for a dash to the finish. Well, remember 1989, Al Unser Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, right here in the same turn, side by side with a couple of laps remaining. One made it through, one didn't. That was Al Unser Jr. He wound up second that year. Right now he leads. Scott Goodyear is right behind, and his father's a little farther back, and Al Jr. begins to accelerate as they head to the green flag. They're going to turn four in Bob Laney. Let's go to Bob Jenkins. All right, we're about to go green once again and settle this thing. The running of the 500-mile race for 1992. Remember 1986, Rahal came out behind Kevin Cogan on the run to the turn one. But Al Jr. moves down to the inside to block Scott Goodyear. Goodyear looked outside, then tucked inside. They're already in number two by the time they got here. The situation was all settled. Gary. About five or six car lengths as they work off turn two down the backstretch. Both drivers using a whole lot of racetrack as they head for turn three. They are down to the inside, down to the outside. Al Jr. with about a four car length advantage, but Scott Goodyear is staying right with him. The man from Toronto, Canada, making a move in four, Bob Lamy. Al Unser still holds him off, but Goodyear right there. They come down toward the start finish line. It is still Goodyear trying to make up some ground. He's closed within two car lengths. Goodyear within two car lengths and one. Can he get him? Can he get him? No, he can't. They're already in the short shoot, headed toward number two. About five car lengths again as they work through turn two. Scott Goodyear a lot lower through the corner than was Al Anzer Jr. But again, all the way down to the inside, almost to the grass, down the back stretch. Now he's set up for turn three. Goodyear closer this time through than he was last. He closes through the third turn, about three car lengths, moves up a little bit closer on Al Jr. in the four. Al still holds him off for Lau with the lead as they go toward the start finish line. Goodyear still trying to catch him, heading to you, Bob. Al Unzer Jr. maintains the lead as 194 laps are completed. 
It almost looks like a singular car coming down the main straight away. A little distance now. Al Unger Jr. has the lead. Once again, the distance just about the same. They work to the nine degree banking of turn two and head down this five. Eight of a mile backstretch halfway through. Headed for turn three and Larry Henry. Well, as I, they always say, it ain't over till it's over. And what a race this has turned into out of nowhere. Al Jr. with about a five car length advantage now on Scott Goodyear. Again, they head to four, and again, Little Al holds him off. Scott Goodyear trying to make up ground, but Little Al holding him off. They head to the start-finish line. Defensive driving is the name of the game here. Alonso Jr. moves way to the inside of the racetrack, running down these straights, trying to block every move of Scott Goodyear. He's in turn three, turn two. Turn two indeed, it's still status quo about, well, now maybe more like eight car lengths, so maybe a little bit bigger gap for Al Unser Jr. Again, as you indicated, Derek, he's blocking as much as he can using all this racetrack there in turn three. Al Jr. has more experience, but Scott Gidier right now, his heart has got to be bigger than the whole state of Indiana as he tries to win the Indianapolis 500. Again, it's Little Al with his dad running third, but Scott Goodyear second. Just a few laps to go, and again, they head toward turn one, and Jerry Baker. Scott Goodyear finished 27th last year. Now he is closed up. He's about three car lengths behind him, and he's making him over the short shoot. It's like a sprint car race. Nose to tail into turn two. About three, four, maybe five car lengths now off the corner, down the back stretch. It's a shootout for the Indianapolis 500. And remember, looking behind is Al Sr. in third. Should something happen as it did in 89? Al Jr., a one car length advantage on Goodyear, who gets all four wheels below the white line. They may make the move in four. Neither one of them ever won this race. It's still Little Al with Scott Goodyear right behind him. They head to the start-finish line. Two more laps to go. Will it be Al Unser Jr. or Scott Goodyear in the 500? Al Unser Jr. is on almost a million and a half dollars here, but he's never won the race, and he's got a lot of work to do. Already in the short shoot, that gap gets closer, Gary. Keep those cameras ready. We can have a photo finish once again, about three or four car lengths as they work down the backstretch. Who's it going to be in turn three, Larry? Seven Indianapolis 500 victories already in the Unser family. Al Jr. trying to add one more. It's about a two-car length advantage on Goodyear this time through three. They head into turn four. Little Al holding him off. Scott Goodyear right behind him. Just over a lap to go. They head to the main straightaway. The start-finish line. Who's going to get it? Dwayne Sweeney waves the white flag. One to go. A three-car length separation between Unzer and Goodyear. And that's how they come through number one. The gap gets closer and closer and closer in front of Gary Lee. Indeed, about three or four car lengths as they work off the second corner for the last time. Headed down the back stretch. Headed right at you, Larry Henry. Scott Goodyear chuck right in behind Al Unser Jr. He's waiting. He's waiting about a car length and a half behind Al Jr. Al Jr. now lengthens it out. He's trying to hold him off. Goodyear low. Junior high. They go to four, Bob Lady. Al Unser Jr. has the lead. One more turn to go. Here they come. Coming to the finish line. Bob Jenkins. Who's going to win it? The checkered flag is out. Goodyear makes a move. Little Al wins by just a few tenths of a second. Perhaps the closest finish in the history of the Indianapolis 500. Al Unser Jr. has become the first second generation driver to win an Indianapolis 500. Al Unser Jr. has done it, holding off the challenge of Scott Goodyear and Sally Larvick is in Little Al's pit. Well, you can imagine the jubilation and you can imagine the hugs and the kisses that are going on. It's hard to get to anybody. Rick, Rick, you want to believe it? That was Rick Gallus saying, I can't believe it. Gotta love it. (laughs) We're with Rick Gallus and Rick. Congratulations on an outstanding. Oh, my guys. And I'll tell you, Al Jr.'s got a lot of, he got the heart of an elephant. It was funny. Nobody talked about us all month. And this race team, just they just keep getting after it and getting after it. And we're not big talkers, but I, I'm really proud. And man, this feels good, Jerry. <laughs> hey, good things happen to good people. Well, you can imagine how Rick Gallus feels, and he's just so full of emotion. Let's go now to Brian Hammonds. Here it's got Goodyear's pitch. You would think that they had just won the race. Jubilation all around here. Here's, here's Scott Goodyear's wife. What are you feeling right now? A little disappointment and a little bit of excitement, but uh, he ran a good race starting from 33rd. You got to be pleased with that. You were very calm these last few laps. I also laps. have Maury Greens here too. I couldn't. I was in awe. I just it was an incredible race. He did a wonderful job, and I'm very happy. It was an unbelievable race, Bob Jenkins. 
Unbelievable is not the word for it. It is over and now arriving in Victory Lane at Indianapolis. The coveted piece of real estate here in front of the master control tower is Al Unser Jr. He has won the 76th running of this event. And Derek, when you talk to Al Unser Jr. in the days preceding this event, he did not talk confidently about having the car to win this race. He has said very, very little all month, uh, preferring to concentrate on just working quietly with the car. However, Rick Gallus did say, watch Al Jr. on race day. And we did say that earlier on, that he is one of the drivers that works with the car, changes it as the pit stops uh, make it necessary to try and get this car to go faster. Now remember, he did profit from the misfortune of Michael Andretti, but a fantastic day for um, Al Unser Jr., but I will bet you that Scott Goodyear is in tears as we speak. Well, Scott Goodyear obviously is disappointed that he did not win this event, but he did a tremendous job here today, driving that car from 33rd position, perhaps will become the uh, best finisher of a driver that was actually bumped from competition and got in uh, because his teammate gave up the seat, Don. Okay, I'll go with that. Uh, we did uh, mention that uh, we did have Tom Sneva finishing second in 1980 uh, in a substitute car because his prime car was wrecked and he had to start uh, in the back row. And then we also had Mario Andretti, as we mentioned, finishing second in 81, uh, a situation there where his car was qualified by Wally Dallenbach because Mario had a Grand Prix commitment. But we've never had a driver bumped, re-qualify, and then finish this high. And the key to Alonso Jr.'s race happened about 20 laps from home when he actually made the pass on Scott Goodyear to take second place because Scott Goodyear did look as if he had at least the speed, maybe a tiny bit more than Alonso Jr., but of course Jr. was driving defensively as he's entitled to do, so the key to the race was made, the pass was made with about 20 laps to go. Congratulations, Alonso Jr. Uh, once again, uh, l let me uh, correct something I said. Uh, uh, Scott Goodyear was bumped, did not re-qualify another car. He substituted for the team car that had been qualified by Mike Groff. So uh, there'll be quite a big asterisk by the name of Mike Groff in the future record books. Well, the celebration is indescribable down below us. The uh, victory lane celebration going on. The big Borg Warner trophy is positioned behind Allen Zer Jr., a big wreath of... Uh, Flowers is about to go around his neck. Allenser Jr. has conquered the ultimate in auto racing, pulling off the victory here today at the Indianapolis 500. Uh, Rick Gallus took the decision to design and build their own car in England. It came out of the box. People suspected that it would not be successful on a super speedway. They said it was spectacular on street circuits.